All right, guys, needle decompression. There's a few ways to needle decompress. Uh, however, if you're in flight, if you're in a very noisy environment, um, let me use this syringe, there's more fluid on it. What I, how I have it set up, even in my, my civilian bag, is I have two needles. Tara, where's that ARS? Where did the ARS needle go? Anybody? Oh, she's over there. Okay, well, I use an ARS needle, so it's an air releasing system needle. All it's, it's the same thing, it's a 14 by three and a quarter. You want to use a 14 gauge by three and a quarter inch catheter or a 12 gauge by three and a quarter inch catheter. You need the length. Um, most of the 14 gauges come with a backing on it. This will not release any air until you pull off the back. So you can also get the ones that I carry that are called ARSs, air releasing system. It just doesn't have this back on it. So either with or without a syringe, the minute I drop it through their patient's chest, it's gonna start venting, okay? However, I think the, the preferred way is to keep your, that, that, that's exactly what I carry in my bags. So to keep the needle and your flush together. So when you pull them out, once again, we talked about Hicks Law, right? Instead of having everything in five different spots, it's gonna lead you to failure. My needles um, and my syringes are like, just like this in my bag. So I pull them out, I pull off the back, I squirt half my saline flush out, leaving me half saline, half air for me to, to pull. I just hook it onto the back of my needle, okay? Finding landmarks. Uh, a lot of people still have to do midclavicular, all right, second to third intercostal space. There's a couple ways to find this spot, all right? You can put your glove finger on in the patient's armpit with your hands open, and you go right between your third and fourth finger. That would work on a lot of people. Um, a lot of people, our, our society is getting much larger. That may not be an option as your hand is way back here, like, uh-oh, what do I do now? So you're gonna expose the area. I find the patient's clavicle, and I find their anatomic nipple line. That is rib four, that's T4. The clavicle, the, your first rib, runs just under your clavicle. So what does that mean? We're going into second, third intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. All right, so I have rib one, I have rib four. I automatically cut that distance in half, and I start palpating. And this patient, I can feel their rib is right along my finger border here, right? I need to be second or third intercostal space. You actually have two options, okay? And it doesn't matter which one you do. So I found his rib. I'm going to pull the skin down because we always need to be on top of the rib with our needle. We have our neurovascular bundle, our artery veins and nerves that run underneath that rib. These 14s and 12s have ginormous bevels on them, as you can see really large bevels. I would not want to be under this patient's rib and have my needle you know, uh, transect that artery, vein, or nerve. Now I can take a pneumo and put them into a hemoneumothorax. Does that make sense? So I found my landmark. I've cleaned the area. I found my rib. And you, some people, you have to be pretty aggressive and push pretty deep to find their rib. I pull that skin down. I pull that skin down and make it nice and tight. With my right hand, because this is my driver hand, this is the hand that I do everything with, shoot with, suture with, whatever. Pull down, I put my needle directly on top, and even if you slightly hit the rib, as soon as I let go of the skin, which way is my needle gonna wanna go? It's always gonna wanna go up, so you're gonna be right on top of that rib every time. As I bury my bevel, I start pulling back, where I can see this. I wouldn't want the label in front because I can't see it. Now, as I drive that needle through his chest, I have this huge rush of air. It may be blood tinge there, that's okay. I stop what I'm doing because I know my bevel and my, my catheter are through into the chest cavity where I need to be. And once again, just like our needle crank, let's take all the other little things out that can mess us up. I use this nice 14 gauge needle itself as a, as a guide rod. I hold my needle where I have it and I just start putting my catheter into my chest, into the patient's chest, all right? I'm not driving my needle any, any farther forward. Now, I can pull my needle back. This is a sharps. It goes right in your sharps container. The patient's gonna start venting. You've already started venting air by getting your bubbles. This way, you know, with a tension pneumothorax, we have to assume that that lung is pretty well collapsed in. But not all tension pneumos, guys, does the lung collapse immediately. And you wouldn't know that until you see a chest x-ray um, where, the, where the lung tissue is. So driving that needle with your with your bubbles, 
in a very noisy environment, it's not like everybody tells you that, oh, you're always going to hear that rush of air or you're going to smell that inner cavitary air. One, I don't want my ears or my nose to be that close to a catheter going in somebody's chest in case blood comes out. All right, that's a, that's a biohazard. So in a noisy environment, you have comms going off. Maybe you're in combat, you have gunfire going off. Once again, this is very easy to see that I've got this big rush of air. If you're not through the chest wall cavity yet, like I'm not through, I'm pulling back, I'm not really getting air bubbles. I mean, I'm really pulling back. Also, once I get in there, now see how easy that is? In the middle of the night for night ops and your NVGs, you don't even need to, I would look, but you, you could just by tactile stimulation, wow, I pulled that syringe back so easy, I'm in nothing but an air-filled cavity. Does that make sense? And that's why you stop driving your needle. If your lung happens to start reinflating, you, you wouldn't want to push this through the lung parenchyma, through the actual lung tissue. But if you inadvertently would, you'd know because the lung is not a hollow cavity. It's filled with millions and millions and millions of alveoli. So if you inadvertently went into lung tissue, you won't be able to pull back your syringe because you're not sucking the air out of the lung because the lung isn't truly hollow. You know, you may get some blood because you may be in a blood vessel, right? But you won't be able to pull back like, uh, something's wrong here, okay? So you have to think about, is my needle all the way down here? And that's why, because maybe I'm in the lung cavity. We always want to go straight in. I would never want to go angle down. What structure could I hit, oh, especially on the left? Heart. His heart, okay? Fourth or fifth intercostal space, for you guys that have that, we have this in combat. This is where we go. We just flip the arm up over the patient's head, just like when we do chest tubes, and that's going to open up that rib space for you. The nipple line is, is, is literally uh, T4. You can also put your hand, once again, your gloved hand, in their axilla. My thumb, just because I have small hands, happens to be right on rib four. That's how it is with me, okay? But I know this is four. We're going in fourth or fifth intercostal space. Once again, you have two spots to do it. And I would do the same thing. Find my fourth or fifth intercostal space. I, I find his lung or his rib right here. I'm gonna pull down and I do everything the same way. This, I have my bevel up just because I like to do the same thing every time let go of the skin, I put it through his chest, and as I go into the space, I get that nice big rush of air. Boom, I'm done, okay? If it's a term pregnant lady, okay, you've got a term pregnancy, it's an MVA, uh, you know, maybe she had a crush injury and she's term. Now, we just move up one rib space, third or fourth intercostal space, and you're not gonna hit the baby. It's so, as remember, as she's term, and her fundus is pushing up on all structures, it actually pushes up on her diaphragm. And you want to stay third or fourth so you don't inadvertently put your needle through their diaphragm. And once again, especially on the side, okay, on the, on the left side, if you angle down, conceivably, without that long needle, you could hit the spleen. On the right side, what big structure could you go through? The liver. You're like, wow, this is a really bad hemothorax. Hey, can you give me another syringe, Cora? I mean, wow, I've got a liter of fluid. You puncture the liver, right? So if it's, you're gonna go um, anterior axillary, so just anterior to the, ax in the, in the axilla, right? Which means I'm gonna cut the chest in half and I'm just gonna go forward a little bit. If you drop a needle in, remember needles give you, especially with a severe tension, a needle is gonna give you maybe five minutes to 10 tops of, of time, right? The patient's like, I was better. But I'm starting, it's starting to get worse again. What's happening? The patient's retentioning, all right? So what are you gonna do? You already have your first needle in there. So this is very simple. I would repeat the exact same process using my syringe. You're always gonna place the needles laterally. You always wanna go laterally. I wouldn't wanna go immediately because now we're starting to get into the mediastinum, bigger, deeper vessels in there, subclavians. Um, if you're a superior vena cava, I would not wanna hit that. I'm just going to go pretty close to my needle. I'm not going to give you an exact marker because it doesn't matter. Still recheck my landmarks to make sure I'm over that rib again. And I'm just going to drop that needle in. Boom. Look at that beautiful rush of air. I'm going to just float my catheter in. Boom. Sharps away. If you have to come, especially you guys with longer transports, if you show up at our hospital with three or four needles in and the guy's alive and you keep reducing that tension, so be it. That's what you'll do. He'll immediately get a chest tube. Okay. With these catheters, 
it's, it's very preferable that you try to sink and hub these catheters as close to the, the hub as possible. This is not going to do too much for your patient. It's going to flop around, you can kink it off, and the theory is, and it's not theory, it's fact, when you put the needle through the, through the lung tissue, and there's a lot of videos on there, that lung is down here. Now I've hubbed my catheter. As it's letting air escape, more air is going to escape in the immediate aftermath of putting that needle through, because that's where the most pressure is. As that lung is re-expanding, because the pressure is going away, a couple things are going to happen. It's probably going to start kinking your catheter off like that. And so it's going to stop, and now, with the breast, he's gonna start reaccumulating, right? So this is what happens. And he starts going in attention again. Well, that catheter may be kinked off. That catheter may have blood into it right now. All right, and that's why I would just put a new catheter in every single time. If you run out of catheters, well, and they're retentioning, you can take a flush and just shoot one or two mLs through here and try to, try to flush your catheter out. One or two mLs of serial saline in, in the guy's chest cavity is not gonna matter at all. But don't give up. Drop another needle. Have your other needle standing by, okay? And these are all the little tricks of the trade to help save the patient's life. And there's very little damage you can do. So with the glove finger, uh, I personally have never done that because to, you have to cut off the, a glove finger. You've got to pre put it through. It's it's not a wrong technique. You're trying to use it as a, as a one-way flutter valve, okay? You gotta pre-put the, the, the glove through here and let it hang off the side. Well, once I pull that out, where's my glove? On here, all right? Um, I guarantee you, with this little catheter sitting in my chest, you have not created an open pneumothorax, okay? Air to come into the chest needs to be at least one third the, the whole of the diameter of your trachea for me to suck in air. Does that make sense? So we used to teach that all the time. As it like, so when they suck in, the glove would come over the catheter. And then when they blow out, it would kind of blow out. I would not worry about that. You guys don't have time. When they're in tension, you need a needle in their chest right now to keep them from going into PEA arrest. Isn't that one of the T's for, for H's and T's? Tension pneumothorax. So we don't do that at our trauma center. Uh, and the times I've placed needles, I've, I've never used the glove. And I'm not saying that it's a wrong technique. I'm just, what I am saying and what I'm big on is Hicks Law. And the more, more ways I give you, put a glove on it. Well, do I do a nitro glove? Do I do a latex glove? Do, the, more, the more ways you're going to screw that up. Drive that needle through the chest, evacuate that air, get them to hot lights and cold steel. They, they need an OR or they at least need a chest tube in a trauma bay. Does that make sense? Or the flight crew will land. I've done chest tubes on scene. You know, that's what it takes, especially if you pre needle them. That's what we're going to do, all right? If you have to go to positive pressure ventilation, you guys will change even a needled pneumo. You'll change that to attention probably within about 10 breaths. And you'll know. You'll be like, oh, my God, I can barely squeeze that in. We'll be back. Drop another needle, bro. Oh, yeah, that's a little bit better. And that's going to give you about five minutes of time. Okay, so try not to ever use positive pressure ventilation when you have a known uh, pneumo, especially a pneumo going into attention. You're pumping in 500 cc's of air. How much air is coming out with every breath through just that little teeny tiny catheter? Does that make sense? So you need to think about that as a paramedic. And that's where you can use the BVM as a murder weapon. If you don't know what you're doing with that BVM, and you just start giving them way too much tidal volume with a little teeny tiny needle. Uh, the, other, the other parts with needle tube, if they have an open pneumothorax, cover that thing up. All four sides, in my opinion, right now, because the literature keeps changing, but that's what I do. So I did overseas, I cover up all four sides, then when they start showing signs of tension, I'm just gonna drop a needle. Because I know that works, okay? Leaving that open pneumothorax, yeah, they're venting, but he's sucking air into that too. Keeps collapsing that lung faster and faster. So just cover it up, wait for him to show signs of tension, which is hypotension, air anxiety, right? They're freaking out, they can't breathe. S uh, pulse is going through the roof, SpO2 is dropping, I wouldn't even worry about their end title right now because they're going to be breathing pretty tachypnic anyways. All right? Those are your signs of tension pneumothorax. Make, that, make it happen. Drop that needle. We good?